So today we're going to be talking a little bit about emotional intelligence. And part of the reason is because with everything going on in the world, I want to give you guys as many tools as I can to navigate these difficult times because we have so much information and opinions bombarding us at every second. And I know a lot of people that are in the spiritual community that are light workers that are here to make a difference and change in the world don't want to be sucked into polarity of either side because we feel the pain of both sides. We feel, and not just with what's going on in the world, in the Middle East, all over the world, things that are being covered on the news and things that are not being covered on the news. So um, last week we talked about holding your light in times of darkness, and we used excerpts from the book Bringers of the Dawn. That was filled with so many great tools. If you're a light worker, if you're someone here on this mission to make a difference in the world. But today, I wanted to provide some more resources for you guys. So we're going to be checking in with some information from the Heart Math Institute. So this information, I have actually a PDF of the book linked below in the description. It's called The Heart Math Solution. And if you go below, um, maybe just download the PDF if you're interested, because I don't know how long it's going to be available. It's through archive.org. So sometimes free books are on there, and then sometimes they get pulled later. So if you're interested in the full book, then I highly suggest to um, download that as quick as you can. So um, I have so many pages of notes for today, so let's get right into it. So we're talking about emotional intelligence, and this is all coming back to heart intelligence. And for a long time, we have interpreted intelligence as being only intellect. But then we have something like the Heart Math Institute who has combined some spirituality with a lot of scientific information, and their whole thing is about the heart. So I have tons and tons of notes, and we're going to jump right into it. So um, these are a bunch of quotes that I've taken from the book. And like I said, that's available below. Um, if you want to download it and read the whole thing, there's a lot more resources and a lot more information available in there. So I want to start with an Albert Einstein quote that they have in the book. It's called The Heart Math Solution. And Albert Einstein said years ago, the significant problems that we face today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And I think that's so perfect as to what's going on in the world right now. The problems were created at a different level of intelligence than we are at right now. And that's the way that this book starts off with talking about the evolution of intelligence going beyond just the mind to the heart intelligence. Uh, does the heart operate simply under the direction of the brain, or does it possess an intelligence of sorts that has an influence on our mind and emotions? In the past, there have been poets and things that have said things along the lines of, only with the heart can we see rightly what is essential is, sorry. <laughs> It's poetry. Um, it was a little hard to read. Basically, um, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And we hear this a lot of times. We hear how sometimes only things that can be seen with the heart, things that we can't see with our eyes, things that we can't see with our intellect, that we can't see with our mind. And they have so many amazing examples of this that even though the work that they're doing is very new and progressive, they say that this idea of the heart having its own intelligence has been around for a very long time. So they say a lot of times in our language, in the English language, we say things like when people are being sincere, they're speaking from the heart. When people are throwing themselves into some activity, they're doing it with all of their heart. When people betray their own best interest, they're thinking with their head and not with their heart. When someone falls into despair, they become disheartened. 
our gestures even indicate the importance of the heart because when we talk about ourselves, we always point to our own hearts. And so there is this level of knowing around the heart, the importance of the heart and the intelligence of the heart, even though in our Western culture, it's very seen as the mind is more important than the heart. But actually, many of the things that are most important we do use this terminology of the heart. And it goes beyond the English language and it goes beyond modern times. Um, So here's some examples. The heart always sees before the head can see, which is true. Um, In the Old Testament, in Proverbs 23, 7, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to read the um, Bible chapters out loud, if that's how you're supposed to do it. For the man thinketh in his heart, and so is he. In the New Testament, in Luke 5.22, what reason is in ye hearts? Um, In ancient Judaic tradition, the heart center, the sephirot, is the energy center. In Kabbalah, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the Um, the tree of life in Kabbalah. The center, the sphere in the center is the heart center. And that is the only point that touches all 10 points of the entire tree of life. And that's because it is the center of it all. It really is. And this is the importance of the heart. And that's why I'm giving a lot of these examples that are really interesting from this book, because we actually already know all of this. This is not going to be, this is really just a remembrance of information that we've already had access to and we already inherently know. And that emotional intelligence is even more than what we think. The body equilibrium um, is attributed to the heart in yogic traditions. So those of you who practice yoga understand the importance of the heart and the importance of balance of the heart within yoga. Um, In Chinese medicine, the heart is seen as the connection between the mind and the body. They also use the word shen, S-H-E-N, which can be translated to both heart. It's talking about the heart, but it can be translated to both mind and spirit. The mind and spirit is housed in the heart, and it's believed that the blood vessels are the communication channels that carry the heart's vital rhythmic messages throughout our body. Now, in our Western culture, the way that we interpret the heart um, is oftentimes very downplayed. It's basically just this organ um, that does a job in our body and that it's exclusively just this organ that pumps blood and we talk about all these things around the heart but then a lot of times when it comes to teaching about the heart a lot of this other knowledge has been um, dismissed so another thing from the Chinese language that is really interesting is even though we just talk about the heart like it's an organ here, in the Chinese language, and as you guys know, Chinese is a character-based language, and the words thinking, thought, intent, listening, virtue, and love all contain the character of the heart within it, which is interesting. All of these words have within them the character in Chinese for heart. In the Japanese language, there are two distinct words to describe the heart. Um, Shinzu is the physical organ, and Kokoro refers to the mind of the heart. So in the Japanese language, there's they differentiate with the word between when you're talking about the organ or when we're talking about the emotional intelligence of the heart. Um, and like I said, most of us are taught that this is just an organ that uh, pumps blood and maintains circulation. And 
one that is devoid of independent intelligence or of actual emotions. Um, however, the heart, even as an organ, is pretty incredible. Um, it it works uninterrupted for 70 to 80 years. Um, it never needs cleaning or repair or replacement. Of course, we have people who have heart complications, but the majority of people and the majority of hearts pump for 80 years straight. It's an incredible tool, an incredible vessel that is, um, it beats 100,000 times a day. It pumps two gallons of blood per minute, and that's well over 100 gallons an hour that it is pumping blood through us. Um, Also, some more stuff about the heart. The heart beats in an unborn fetus before the brain is even formed. Scientists still don't exactly know what triggers the beating. There's a word called autorhythmic to indicate how the heartbeat is a cell is self-initiated from within the heart. As the be- as the brain begins to develop within a fetus, um, it grows from the bottom art, the bottom up, starting with the most primitive part, then going to the emotional centers. And so it's interesting that the emotional centers of the heart are developed before the rational, logical part, which will then come after those emotional centers. And the beating of the heart obviously starts before the brain is even developed. So the source of the heartbeat is within itself, and the timing of the heartbeat is believed to be controlled by the brain. However, when people get a heart transplant, the connection from the heart to the brain is severed. So when they then get the new heart, Doctors have never figured out how to make that connection again, but the heart will beat again. So the heart even beats without that connection to the brain. So just a little bit of fun facts that are in the beginning of the book, because um, really just talking about the importance of the heart and the magnificence of the heart as an organ, but also as something much greater that we all do know. And, you know, as you guys know from some of my Previous videos since coming back from Rhythmia, from doing the ayahuasca, um, that was one of the things that has been most important to me on this stage of my spiritual journey has been, you know, coming from the mind, which I am such a mental person. You know, I'm a logical person. I'm a thinker more than I'm a feeler. And this has been the part of my journey that has been a lot of slowing down from going from the heart and dropping down to, going from the mind and dropping down to the heart center. So this is something that right now with everything going on in the world, I know that we are all feeling a lot of social pressure. There's a lot of people who don't want people to not give their opinion. There's a lot of social pressure, social peer pressure to give a statement. And it's like, you're not the president. You don't need to give a statement. And everyone wants to know people's opinions and from their mind and this and that. And it's like, it's our job. And if you remember what we talked about last week, some of the quotes from Bringers of the Dawn was that emotions are the non-physical world. And us being in our emotions keeps us connected to humanity, but also connects the non-physical world to humanity. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to start. um, And, you know, right now, there's not a lot of easy things to say in this time. I see a lot of people who are spiritual practitioners and teachers trying to say the right thing. And even that, they're getting crucified for what they're saying. Because I understand that a lot of people are giving the advice to kind of... um, worry about yourself, maintain your high vibe and stuff like that. But as we talked about last week, emotions, empathy, all of these things are actually keeping us connected to our human, to our humanity, to what's going on in the world. And it's not a time for escapism, but it's not a time also that we have to know all of the right answers in our mind. You know, these, like we started with that Albert Einstein quote, um, 
the significant problems that we face today cannot be solved by the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And that's really where we're at right now is, and that's why I wanted to talk about the level of intelligence moving from intellect to the next level of intelligence and starting to understand our emotional intelligence. So what is intelligence? The first IQ tests were designed in the early um, part of this past century. In the book, it says this century, but it, that book is like from the 90s or whatever. So um, in the beginning of the 1900s, they created the IQ test to measure the intelligence and the co- cognitive ability and intellect. And they found that IQ scores do not really increase from kindergarten to adulthood. And this led them to believe that IQ is primarily inherited because it doesn't really matter how much knowledge you gain. Your intelligence level, your IQ level always stays about the same. However, that is not the case for emotional intelligence. That's the good news. Um, And this is what we're evolving into right now as a species. So it was in the 80s. uh, There was a professor named John Mayer, a different John Mayer, no relation, uh, who created the term emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence includes five domains. Knowing one's emotions, managing one's emotions, motivating oneself, recognizing emotions in others, and handling relationships. And then about five years later was when emotional quotient came up, which is the EQ. So sometimes people say emotional intelligence. They say EQ instead of like IQ. Um, So that comes up a lot too, but we're going to be talking about it in saying emotional intelligence. Um, So emotional intelligence can grow over time. And it is something that is not inherited It's something that we can develop. And this is great for us right now of trying to navigate what to do in this world at this time, because we're not going to solve the problems in the Middle East by sharing your opinion on social media. Um, I know a lot of people want the pressure to do that. A lot of people are upset that people aren't doing that. And this is why we need to drop to the heart center and to do what feels right for each of us individually. If you feel that that is your calling and that is what you need to do and that's going to make you feel better in your heart, then do it. But if you feel that you don't know the right thing to say and you feel pressured to say something because other people are upset that you're not giving opinions, this is why we want to develop emotional intelligence because this is the way that we move to the next levels of humanity. So some other things about emotional intelligence. Um, In this book, they say this is the ABCs of emotional intelligence. Uh, self-awareness, seeing the links between thoughts, feelings, reactions. Okay. So self-awareness is important. The link between thoughts, feelings, and reactions, knowing if thoughts or feelings is ruling a decision, which is important. Right. And we're going to get more into that as this goes on. Seeing the consequences of alternative choices. That's another part of emotional intelligence. Say, for example, If I do this, this is going to be the outcome. If I do this, this is going to be the outcome. You know, this outcome might hurt someone. This outcome might cause someone else to feel insecure. You know, that's levels of emotional intelligence. And applying these insights to choices. So being able to apply emotions to choices. So the heart is the source of emotional intelligence. And that's why we started off with kind of talking about the importance of the heart and how we do inherently know this. We already know that the heart is so important because all of these ways that we speak about the heart socially, doing it from the heart, um, you know, things like that, we know that that is actually what emotional intelligence is. So this is kind of, You know, the Heart Math Institute is more about the research behind it, but we already know this information. So I want to provide some of the um, tools, resources, research. Like I said, the PDF of the whole entire book is in the description below. Okay. So in the Heart Math Institute, uh, they 
they concluded that intelligence and intuition are heightened when we listen more deeply to our own heart. It's through learning how to decipher the messages that we receive from our heart that we can gain a better perception. And so much about heart intelligence and emotional intelligence comes from perception. So guiding influence of the heart, we can easily fall prey to reactive emotions such as insecurity, anger, fear, blame. This is what we are all having bombarded at us right now. Reactions, fear, shame, guilt, blame. We're being bombarded on every single level with it. And one of the other important things is being able to tell um, other people's energy from your own and also being able to identify things that are energy drainers. This is all important about emotional intelligence because a big part of emotional intelligence is being able to see what is draining your energy, okay? And then all of these things too. So the Heart Math Institute is all about research. There's a lot of different studies in the book. There's a lot of different charts and things like that. And they say that basically there is so much information that shows that emotional intelligence is also connected to illness and it's connected to aging as well. And there's so much to do with the heart that will eventually lead to illness. And so in their early research, they observed that negative emotions threw the nervous system out of balance. And then when that nervous system is out of balance, the rhythm of their heart appeared jagged and disordered. So the actual rhythm of the heart, the actual heartbeat, when they would map it out on, they would actually see it on a scale. It was jagged and disoriented and disordered and not in a good flow. So we know coming back to what in the Western world we've been taught about the heart is that it is the vital tool that pumps all the blood in our body. So negative emotions, and we can feel this when we're having negative emotions, we can feel our heart uh, is racing or feels off or we feel like off in our chest. Now, imagine that is also the organ that pumps the blood to everywhere in your body. You want that to be pumping in the best way possible, not jagged, not disordered, okay? So a chronic state of your nervous system will lead to cardiovascular imbalance and could put stress on the heart and then other organs because they're not getting the right flow. Your body is not getting the right blood flow that it needs. And this could potentially lead to serious health problems over time. In contrast, they also studied that positive emotions, um, that they found increased order and balance, not only in the rhythm of the heart, but in the nervous system, and that also produced a smoother balance of seeing the actual heartbeat on, on these monitors. So these harmonious and coherent rhythms do more than just reduce stress. They actually not only improve stress, they improve the immune system, which is our whole body's health but they also enhance each person's ability to perceive the world around them. So they found that people who had, you know, more smooth heartbeats because they had a smoother nervous system and more positive emotions had a greater perception of individual situations. So positive emotions such as happiness, appreciation, compassion, care, and love not only change patterns in activity of the nervous system, they also reduce the production of stress hormones. And we know that these stress hormones have all different types of problems with our body. You know, we've all seen the commercial a hundred times on daytime television when you were like homesick. The cortisol produces belly fat, you know? So not only in our physical body, do we see it? But also we know that cortisol is going to mess up all the emotions in our body. It's going to mess up your whole endocrine system. For women, it impacts your periods. We have people, you know, it can make your hair fall out. It could make you gain weight. It can make you lose weight. 
it can make all different types of things happen to your body. So we know the level of stress. And we know that so many times when people go to the doctor with different ailments, how the doctor basically can pretty much say the reason for anything happening to you is stress. So we understand the importance of uh, or the impact of stress on the body. So experiencing care and compassion has actually shown to increase levels of IgA, which is a secretory antibody of the immune system, and it's the first line of defense in your body. So actually increasing these levels in your body fights infections and also fights disease. So on top of it, having positive emotions is also making you healthier. So it also lowers blood pressure. It increases stress-relieving hormones. It increases your body's immune response. And it actually impacts people all the way down to the cellular level. So in the book, they talk more about this. The HeartMath Institute has done all different types of things. So let's talk a little bit about our heart health, our heart intelligence, emotional intelligence, and some of the things that we can do. So first and foremost is we want to acknowledge the heart intelligence and the importance of it. And that's what we're doing right here in the beginning part of this video is really hammering in with the facts, with the information, with the sources, how important this really is. Because it's very easy to look at the world right now and let ourselves get into disarray. But this is also going to affect us on a physical level. So, and we're going to talk about this more coming up because there is let me actually skip ahead to that because this is really important. There is a difference between care and overcare. We'll skip ahead to that because that's really important. Um, okay, so care and overcare. So it's so important for us to care about things, but there is actually a level where you can overcare. And overcare is actually becoming detrimental to your body. So an example of this could be, say you have a friend or even just a situation that's going on in the world right now. You want to have care for the situation. But if you go beyond the level of healthy care, you become depleted, you become drained, you feel sick, you feel immobilized, you feel paralyzed. That's when it goes into overcare. And that's dangerous to you, actually. This is now going beyond what is a healthy, normal level of compassion to a detrimental level of guilt, of shame, of blame, where you go from what would in your mind seem like a positive emotion to actually falling into negative emotions. So this, and we're going to come back to one of the examples of how to work with this, but I just wanted to talk about it because this, they've shown that care. Caring boosts your immune system. Overcaring actually hurts your immune system. So this is why it's so important to get your heart into coherence with your mind because we know we have brain waves and we have a heartbeat, both of which are waves. And we could have, and I've talked about this a hundred times. You know, I've talked about it in so many videos. We talk about the heart coherence technique. I'm not going to go over it again in this because I know you guys have already heard it a hundred times. There's another thing called the freeze frame technique, which is very similar to the heart coherence technique, both of them from the Heart Math Institute. So what we're going to talk about is the freeze frame technique. So if you find yourself going into overcare, this freeze frame technique is the way to go. Okay, so it's similar to the heart coherence. And I've talked to you about using the heart coherence technique before you do spiritual practices so that you're in a state of love and higher vibration. And that means that, you know, your meditations are going to go in that way. If you're channeling, if you're astral projecting, if you're doing that stuff, then you're connecting with beings that mirror love, mirror those higher emotions. A lot of people start channeling when they're all in disarray and not doing work and stuff themselves. And then they wonder why they end up running back to being a reborn, a born again Christian. Not that there's anything wrong with that. but a lot of people do go from the new age to Christianity because they get so scared because they don't center themselves, start channeling, and then they are mirroring lower levels, beings and stuff that reflects their own inner state. They're seeing a reflection of their own inner state and they get so scared and they have no discernment that then they just run back to, and now there's nothing wrong with Jesus. I'm just saying. 
this is something why that happens so often, why people get scared and they're like, it's all demons. Um, it's because they're not getting heart centered before doing spiritual practices and not getting into a frequency of love into these higher emotions before going into the non-physical realms. So, okay, this is the freeze frame technique. This is a great tool. So we all know what a freeze frame is. Um, you know, you watch a movie and then it's like, it freezes and it's like, well, that's me. This is how I got here, you know? Um, and it's really like focusing in on one single part. So they say, see your life as a movie and freeze frame a moment, okay? So if you fall into overcare or you fall into being reactionary or say you've been scrolling on your phone for so long and you're looking at all of the things that are happening in the world and then now you're just like depleted, you're exhausted, you don't feel okay, you don't know what to do, you're like, oh my God, these problems in the world are so big, I want to do something, I don't know what to do and now I'm paralyzed by emotion and now I've gone to the point where I've gone from the positive emotion of compassion to guilt, blame, shame, anger, reaction, and sadness. So the freeze frame is super simple. It's a technique that gives you the power to stop any reaction just like you would hit pause on a movie. So you want to recognize the stressful feeling and freeze frame it. Take a pause. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, scrolling, you're seeing everything that's happening in Israel and Palestine, and you just feel compassion for all of the innocent people on every side of everything and everywhere. You know, it's not just that, you know, there's just an earthquake in um, Afghanistan, Armenian genocides going on. It's like, it's endless. Like as you're looking, it's like day to day, there's, there's no stop to see all of the pain and suffering in the world. And but now you felt yourself go beyond compassion, go beyond empathy into a dark place where now you don't know what to do and you feel powerless. Freeze frame, hit the pause button, and you make a sincere effort to shift your focus away from the racing mind because, and we're going to get into this, there's the lower heart and the higher, the lower heart and the higher heart. Because a lot of times we put things into the heart category that are actually partly in the mind category, and we're going to get into that. So we're going to shift focus away from the problem, and we're going to shift towards our heart. We can transfer the energy from our perception of the problem and open up to possibilities for a solution. So the way that we can do this is we shift from the head to the heart, and this will improve your nervous system heighten your cardiovascular efficiency, and enhances communication between the heart and the brain. So now we know that this is a two-way communication system. Your brain send message, sends messages to the heart, but it's already been proven a thousand times that the heart sends messages to the brain as well. And then we are going to put the communication back up this way. So if you're feeling in this place, same thing as the heart coherence technique. You put your hand on your chest and breathe into the heart center. Now, say your mind is still racing and you're finding it hard in this negative emotion that you're feeling to be able to shift to the heart. You're breathing into the heart, but you just keep getting overwhelmed by the thoughts. One technique that you can use if you're not able to kind of breathe into the heart, they say, think about your toe. Think about your big toe and wiggle your big toe and think about wiggling your big toe. So then if you can't go straight to the heart, Move to another body part. Move all the way down to the toe and think about wiggling the toe. And then you're like, oh, okay, that'll start to pull you away from your head space for a minute. And once you can kind of think about wiggling the toe and then you could start to do that. And then you're like, oh, okay, now let me think about the heart. Now let me feel the heart and breathe into the heart center. So you feel that emotion, whatever that feeling is. You feel like you've gone too far. You hit pause and you're like, okay, you know what? I really need to reset myself because I feel myself going down a bad path right now. You could do this with anger. You could do this with being upset. You could do this with anything. Get yourself to your heart center. If you got to go through your toes first, go through your toes first. Now you breathe into that area, same thing, and just take about 10 seconds of breathing into the heart. And then now you want to recall a positive, fun feeling or a time in your life that you have enjoyed, a person, a place, a thing, 
something that brings you happiness. So this is, you guys who know the heart coherence technique, this is very similar. The heart coherence technique is great for when you're starting something. This freeze frame is when you're already in the mix of it. You're already messed up on that feeling. You've already lost yourself. You've already gotten angry. You've already gotten upset. You're already in this place. The freeze frame is using the heart coherence technique in the moment. So now you're breathing into the heart center. Now you feel yourself getting into the heart center and you're like, okay, you can recall a relaxing vacation, a loved one, your child, your pet, your spouse, your parent, a special moment that you've spent in nature. Maybe there's like a tree. I have a tree that I love. Sometimes I think about that tree because it's just like a nice, serene, simple place. I think about sitting, the tree like grows completely sideways. I love this sideways tree. And then I think about like all these times that I've gone to that tree and I'm like, oh, okay, I can see myself on the tree. And now you don't want to just think about it. You want to drop down to the heart and you want to feel it. So say if you're recalling a vacation, you're like, oh, okay, I remember being in on the beach. Oh, I remember looking at the sunset that day. Now let me drop into that feeling. Let me drop into what it felt like when I was with a friend uh, on vacation, when I was with a spouse on vacation. How about, you know, recalling back into the feeling. So you get to the moment and then start reliving the feeling a little bit. You know, feel the water, feel the waves, feel the sun, see the moon. You start pulling yourself into the feeling. So not just the thought of the place, start not just the visualization of it. Drop into the feeling. Try to relive it. Now that you have pulled yourself into that, you're going to use your intuition, your common sense, and your sincerity and ask your heart, what would be a more efficient response to this situation? What would help me minimize future stress? So let's say you're looking at the problems in the world right now and you're able to now pull yourself into your heart center. You're reliving something that was really enjoyable for you in your past. And then you're like, okay, now that I'm here, now that I'm on this beach in Hawaii inside my mind, let me think about what is the best way actually for me to handle this? And this is when you're going to drop into your heart center, get your intuition, get your common sense, get your sincerity. Now, sometimes you might already know the answer. And sometimes the answer might be a download. You know, sometimes the answer might be a breakthrough of new information, or sometimes the information is going to be common sense. It's going to be something that you already know. And while you're doing this, keep thinking. Breathing into the heart. Keep your hand on the heart. Really do your best to stay in that heart center because it's easy to start going back into the thought. If you feel yourself kind of coming back into thought, take yourself back to that place, back to that relaxed place, back to that positive memory, back to your wedding day, back to the day you gave birth to your child. Take yourself back to that moment and then again ask the question, okay, what is the best way for me to proceed with this? What is the best way for me to handle my stress in this situation? And now you listen to what your heart has to say. Um, now, like I said, sometimes this could be really quick and simple. And sometimes it's going to be like, okay, you're mad at your husband. And you're angry at him about, you know, not closing any of the cabinets. And they're all open. And he left everything open. A more simple thing, a more simple solution. Okay, you drop down to your heart center, you do the whole thing, and you listen to your heart. Now, in that case, it might be a simple answer like, you know, he's not doing it for any wrong reason. He's not doing it to be a jerk. It's just he's a little absent-minded, and you love him, and in some ways, that little absent-minded is actually what helps him to deal with some of your downfalls too. You know, maybe that's the answer, or maybe it's a bigger problem. And you're going to need a bit more guidance from the answer. But you're going to listen to your heart. And your heart is going to tell your mind now. Communicate back up to the mind. So there is some um, biology behind this. Because as we know, this is the HeartMath Institute that created this. So this stuff is all backed up with their um, evidence and their... So this will change the, the pace of your breath. Will change the pace of your heart rate. 
and it will also lower blood pressure. They've, and in the book, you can see that there's um, charts that show that. Now, what makes this different than some other techniques? So what makes this different than meditation, regular meditation? So a lot of meditation techniques are actually very much in the mind. It's very much visual. It's very much using these upper three chakras, you know? Now, this is important because it's going beyond that. It's going beyond just your mind. It's really dropping it into the heart center. And this is where we get into that emotional intelligence. And this is where you can improve your emotional intelligence in the moment. You know, we can all read the self-help books, but in the moment when you're angry or in the moment when you're stuck in the doom scrolling or in that moment when you're in traffic. Now, that's the thing, too, is like meditation. A lot of times you have to close your eyes and be kind of pulled away from the world. You could do this in traffic, in driving, you know. You could do this out in the world. It doesn't take a full-blown pulling out of reality to do it. So this comes to, this brings us to engaging core heart feelings. And core heart feelings will shift you from thinking to feeling. It shifts the heartbeat to a smoother rate. And then, as we said, this puts you in coherence. Now your mind and your heart are on the same page. This is improving your immune system. This is improving um, all, literally, your body, your body is able to even fight off diseases, everything. Um, this is why we see people that are generally more positive uh, live longer, are more mobile into their old age. And people that are, you know, miserable and grouchy usually have more health problems, you know, and people can get, you know, upset by that. A lot of people don't like to hear those things, but we have eyes. We have the ability to see things, you know, and that's not impractical to observe. Okay. I have so many more notes. So let me move quickly. Okay. So the core heart feelings. Core heart feelings are love, compassion, non-judgment, courage, patience, sincerity, forgiveness, appreciation, and care. All of these will increase the synchronization and coherence of the heart's rhythmic patterns and improves the overall health of your body. When you consciously invoke these, these core heart feelings, it nourishes the body at such a deep level. They say it is almost like quantum nutrients for your body. And it literally helps your cells in regenerating. So if you find yourself in some type of communication that is difficult or draining, um, this is where you need to pull back and do this freeze frame technique. Or, you know, if you find yourself in draining situations, you're communicating with someone and then you're drained, these are the indicators that you're going beyond compassion, you're going beyond empathy, and you're going into a different realm. You're going into these lower heart feelings. So let's see, do I have that here? Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the higher heart and the lower heart feelings. So you might say something like, you know what, I followed my heart once before and I got hurt and I'll never do it again. And I've been there. This is why my heart was so closed off, you know, so I 100% get it. And this is also, you know, part of the reason that I'm reading this book is because this is the way that I want to be staying more in my heart as someone who is a thinker, and it's a lot easier for me to stay in my mind than for me to, you know, having that feeling of like, yeah, well, once you've been betrayed emotionally, you go into survival mode about your heart, and you're like, well, can I trust my heart? You know, because then I was betrayed, then I was hurt. I trusted my heart, and I got taken advantage of. Now, they make such a great point about this. So a lot of times that is going to group everything into the heart, but it's not actually all heart, okay? So the ability to protect ourselves from pain is actually a function of the brain. It's not a function of the heart. 
So when we find ourselves saying, yeah, my heart is the one that got me into this problem. My heart is the one is the reason why I'm, in, I'm divorced or I'm this or I'm that. These are actually the brain sending messages to the heart, okay? Because it's your brain's job to do survival tasks. So when we find ourselves saying, no, I'm not going to trust my heart, that's actually not listening to the heart. That's listening to the brain. And this is why we want to differentiate between not all feelings only come from the heart. Sometimes our brain is sending things towards the heart, okay? So cutting off the heart and having misguided defensiveness is actually um, not a heart emotion. It's actually not from the heart. It's from the mind. And the fact that we feel something strongly like anger, fear, and desire doesn't always mean that that is driven from the heart. The head often uses emotional backup and it can hijack emotions to defend us from fears. It can use emotions to project stuff, projections about reality, projections about people, projections about groups of people do not come from the heart. They come from the mind, but the mind can hijack emotions and trick us into thinking that it's coming from the heart. And that's because our, our brain's job is to keep us alive and to, for survival. You know, the heart is just going to pump away and do its job. The brain can hijack that sometimes. So a good way to avoid this confusion, they like to use the term higher and lower heart. So the lower heart refers to those feelings colored by attachments and conditions. So sometimes a lower heart um, emotion could be something like, Damn, let's use the example going on right now. Say you really don't know what to say in the political issues and the humanitarian issues that are happening in the world right now. You don't know what to say. You don't know any better of what to do, but there's now you're feeling this guilt in your heart saying, oh man, but silence is violence. Oh man, if I don't say anything, I'm letting people down. I'm letting my friends on this side down. I'm letting my friends on this side down. That's actually not a heart emotion. This is your brain hijacking the heart. So what they say is your lower heart emotions are being manipulated by some type of thoughts, want, guilt, obligation. When it comes to obligations, this is not operating from the higher levels of the heart. This is operating from the lower levels of the heart. This is your brain hijacking the heart. Okay. Now, higher heart emotions are more allowing, are more neutral, more unconditional love. So this is what takes maturity. Operating from the actual heart might be, you know what? I have compassion for everything and all sides of this. And I don't know what's the right thing to say. So all I'm going to do is just share love and compassion and share things that are uplifting because that's what feels right to me. That's not, because of this, I have to this. Because of this, I have to that. You have to be able to. So this is another thing. When we're practicing our emotional intelligence and when we're developing, like I said in the beginning, emotional intelligence can grow. So these are the things we want to use. You use the freeze frame technique. We activate those core heart emotions. But then we can also differentiate is that sometimes that feeling of guilt, is the feeling of guilt actually coming from the heart? No, the feeling of guilt is the brain telling the heart something, thoughts hijacking the feelings, and to be able to start to differentiate the two. So this is something you can do in your life. If you're feeling overwhelmed by emotions, you're like, huh, I know I feel it in my chest, but is it my brain telling my heart something? So an example of this would be sympathy. So things that are going on in the world, or maybe we'll use a different example of like something going on with a friend. Say your friend is going through something that is really tragic and you want to spend some time with them and help them out. And, but then you start to feel like this is becoming really draining and now you're feeling a bit wiped out. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You feel sick. You have done now. Sympathy has gone to the level of being drained, maybe even feeling ill yourself. Now, 
that is a lower heart thing because your mind is telling you, as a good friend, I need to fully feel what they're feeling. As a good friend, I need to put myself through this. This is the mind telling the heart what to do. So when sympathy kicks in and your head starts to over-identify with someone else in need, then we start projecting our own concerns. We start projecting our own thoughts on the situation, our own feelings. And then we start to persuade ourselves that this is what it means to be a good friend. This is what it means to be a good ally. This is what it means is that I have to get into that person's feelings. I have to get into that level of pain. I have to get into that level of energy. But this is when we start to go back from care to overcare. And overcare is then we start getting into guilt, shame, pain, all of this stuff. And then this is when we start getting into those emotions that when they've studied them at the heart math are jagged. They're not smooth heartbeats. This is a jagged heartbeat. And this jagged heartbeat is sending jagged blood beats circulating all around your body. This is affecting your body. This is affecting your immune system. This is why you feel drained. This is why you feel paralyzed emotionally where now you can't even get out of bed. So this is a great time to use that freeze frame. And then listen to your heart. What is the right thing to do? Hit the pause button. Take a moment to recenter. Pull yourself away from the situation. Get to that heart-centered feeling through a memory, through a feeling, through love. And then ask your heart, how do I handle this? What is the best thing for me to do right now? How can I still be there for people but also be able to be there for myself right now and be able to do the functions that I need to do. So compassion, on the other hand. Now, when they've studied compassion, it actually gives you regenerative energy. So feeling compassion actually gives you energy. This is how you know if you're going too far into overcaring versus compassion. When you're absorbing the feelings, you're going beyond compassion. So also compassion offers intuitive understanding and potential solutions. So in a place of compassion, it's easier for you to find something to say. It's easier for you to find the right words, to find the right place to how to handle it. Because this brings you back to your authenticity. So... You can feel compassion, but you don't want to feel the suffering so much that it becomes your responsibility and your despair because you want to care about the person's problems and concerns and you love them, but then you will need to go back to the higher heart compassion versus the lower heart sympathy. And now we learn to make this distinction between higher heart and lower heart. And this is a problem for a lot of empaths. And I know a lot of you guys are empaths out there. This is a big, like a survival tool for you at this point, because there's a lot of stuff happening in the world. And, you know, I don't mean to be bleak, but it's not going to be quickly resolved or easily resolved. And it's, it's going to take time. You know, and we don't know what the solutions are. And there's a lot of greedy hands putting their two cents and their $2 billion and their this and this. And lives are all being used like pawns right now. And this is only going to lead to things that spread out to other parts of the world. So you really need to be able to take the time and say, okay, I've gone too far into overconnecting with the situation to now I've absorbed it. And then you can't really do what you need to do in this world by being a light in this world, by uplifting in this world. So we want to notice that these are not both heart-based emotions. This is a lot of times the mind is getting lumped in with the heart. The mind is saying, I need to do something. I need to this. I need this. It's sending the message to the heart. Some other examples of things along these lines with the um, 
the heart feelings being over governed by the mind. Things when we say, I'm not mad, I'm just hurt. We're dismissing the feeling of being angry and our mind is sending the message of, I'm not this, I'm that. Okay. So we want to catch ourselves when we're saying things like that. These are good indicators that you're not really in your heart center, even though it feels like you're in the heart center because this all this stuff is happening in your chest. I'm not upset. I'm just disappointed. Now, being disappointed is a lot less intense than being upset. So a lot of times we'll take ourselves from the thing that's more intense to the thing that's less intense. I'm not mad. I'm hurt. This being hurt might be less intense than anger. I'm not upset. I'm disappointed. We're taking ourselves from something more intense to something less. These are the brain sending survival to the heart. The survival mechanisms of the brain are being sent to the heart. And now disappointment is less intense. Although disappointment is depleting. We already know it. When someone is disappointed, it depletes them physically. And we can see it. We can see it on their face when someone is disappointed. We can hear it in their energy. We hear it when we're disappointed. It's a full downward it's in your face, it's in your words, it's in everything. It's having a physiolo- physiological effect on you. So even though we're moving from the less intense emotion, our mind rationalizes it and brings us down to this survival of let's go from the less intense emotion to the one that's easier to deal with. We're doing a whole entire negative effect on our body. When we say things like, um, it's just not fair, I've been misunderstood, it's the principle of it. Uh, I have a right to be hurt or angry or betrayed. If only I had just, you know, these sayings are rationalizing feelings. And this is when the brain starts to hijack the heart again. So this is all really important stuff to catch ourselves when we're doing. And it doesn't mean like we need the absolute solution for all of them. These are the things to think about when we're developing our emotional intelligence. Because our emotional intelligence can grow. So we want to catch ourselves when we're saying, I'm not upset, I'm disappointed. Oh, okay, now your brain is taking over the heart. And now you're not allowing this emotional intelligence to develop. I have a lot of notes, but I am coming up on the hour here. And I do have to go somewhere after this. So let me do a quick passing over of my notes and see what um, I forgot. Okay, the heart intelligence provides an intuitive, direct knowingness that is an essential aspect for our overall intelligence, okay? So developing our emotional intelligence develops overall intelligence. Of course, we're saying like in the standard definition, they say that intelligence is just your IQ, IQ, just your intellect. But actually, intelligence is the combination of all of these different intelligences that are in our body. And there's more than just the two types of intelligence. So it's the heart intelligence is engaged. When it's engaged, our awareness is expanded beyond linear and logical thinking. And as a result, our perception becomes more flexible. We become more creative. We become more comprehensive. So here's an example. There's two people who are in love and they're out in the park and it starts raining. So now have being that they're in love and it starts raining, maybe they start getting rained on and they're like, oh, oh my God, whoa, this is so, ha, ha, ha. you know, and then they're just like, they're in their hearts at that moment. They're so in their hearts that they're like, this is even romantic. We see this at movies all the time. It starts raining on them and they kiss in the rain and they're like, oh my God, this is so romantic. This is being in the heart. And they see the rain as something natural because they're in the heart center. So when your emotional intelligence and your heart intelligence expands and you allow yourself to live in it, that is something where you can have the perception of this is something natural. This is, it's just water. It's going to dry it's fine. We're having a great time in the park. This is sweet. This is romantic. Now say that same couple is arguing. They're away from their heart center. They're in their minds. They're like, yeah, but the heart is hijacking the emotions, is hard, is hijacking the heart. Now these people are like, this is annoying. This is frustrating. This is fucking pissing me off. 
This rain is a major inconvenience. This rain, even though it will dry, is exactly what I did not need right now. My hair, my this, my makeup, my shoes. We get all caught up in all of the stuff in the brain. But it is literally the same exact thing happening. And this is why it's a good example of heart intelligence and emotional intelligence because the same exact thing, the same exact circumstances and the same exact couple in the same exact situation. But when you're in your head, you're going to be maybe frustrated by the rain. You're in your heart. You're like, it's water. It dries. Who cares? Like, sure, you know, my hair is going to get messed up. It's hair. You wash it and you do it again one day. Who gives a shit? You know, so this is the important thing of finding ourselves developing that emotional intelligence because you see how something like rain, your perception of an experience becomes expanded. So when you see something from the heart, um, it's going to expand your perception on everything and it actually will develop your intellect. It will develop your logic. And it will develop your creativity, your comprehension of a situation. And I think you guys, you know, saw that with me after coming back from Rhythmia, after coming back from the ayahuasca ceremony, I, my perception of evil completely changed. My perception of darkness completely changed. My perception of the bad things in the world was totally changed. And that's because I dropped from the head to the heart. And now I have this greater perception on things. So let me see if there's any other last things that I want to share. And as we know, when we're in this, we're creating stress. And the stress is so detrimental to our body. And one of the things, too, is that when our heart is in coherence, when we get it to that smooth beat instead of that jagged beat, that jagged beat is actually draining your vitality. It's actually exhausting your body. It's taking energy to survive. To just breathe and stand there when you're in a state of stress is actually harming your body. It's taking energy. This is why when you're so stressed, you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Oh, my God. I don't know why I'm so tired today. That's because stress takes away from your vitality. When your heart is beating all jagged and crazy because you're in the state of not in coherence, then... That's why you're going to be exhausted. However, when you are in coherence, no energy is wasted by just living, by just breathing, by just standing there. This is why it's so important to take the time to drop into our heart center and develop our emotional intelligence. So just to remember, when we find ourselves feeling so much sympathy that it becomes painful and detrimental, this is a great time to do the freeze frame technique. This is a great time to pull back and to say, wait, is my head, is this like my head hijacking my heart right now? I'm feeling guilt. I'm feeling blame. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling obligated. Let me drop back into my heart and listen to what my heart has to say. And like we said, those part, the end part of that freeze frame technique is listening to what the heart has to tell you. And a lot of times it's going to be a common sense answer, but sometimes it's going to be a download, a full revelation like it was for me with the ayahuasca, but that was an extreme dropping into the heart. It was like a full-blown, crazy downloads. But then sometimes it's going to be common sense. Sometimes it's going to be like, it's just fucking rain. It's just water. It's going to dry. I'll do my hair again. I'll wash my makeup off. Who cares? It's one day. Um, Turn Racing, thank you for the super chat. Let me read it. Thank you so much. So Turn Racing has to say, this is like listening to your gut. I wonder if that is the quantum information received from the lower gut. And that we are supposed to bring it to the higher consciousness. Just how, love how we bring our experience to source. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I actually, I so agree with that, with the gut feeling. Sometimes that gut feeling, it's, that's not from our brain. That's coming from a lower part of our body. But actually, you're right. Like, that could totally be coming from the quantum level because there's also a lot of information, which I didn't share here, 
um, but in Joe Dispenza's work and a lot of work that says a lot of times when bad things have happened in the world or danger is on the way or something like that, that people actually start to feel anxious before it happens. You know, they, I think it was with 9-11 that they said that there was like spikes in a lot of different like things before this happened, like earlier in that morning and earlier in the day, there was like all of these different things that like went off the charts and stuff. And they were like, what is going on? So I feel like maybe it is some quantum information that sometimes because our heart is able to read something too, we know that sometimes if there's danger, we can't, our mind doesn't know what the danger is yet because it hasn't seen it. It hasn't heard it. It hasn't perceived it, but our heart feels like something's off. Something, I feel like something bad is going to happen. I feel like I need to be careful. And then something happens and you're like, oh my God, I, I knew something was off. So I think that you're totally right. I think that our heart and that gut feeling sometimes is us getting a message on a quantum level that something is on the way. And also I've talked about this in one of my other videos before about the higher self. Our higher self communicates with us with the chakra that we're going to listen to. So some of us, if we're listening through that crown chakra, the higher self is communicating through that. Some of us are listening with our heart chakra and that's the higher self is going to communicate with you through that. A lot of us, it's easy in those three lower survival chakras. So sometimes you'll get like a pain in your stomach and you're like, oh God, my stomach just dropped. Oh God, I feel like something bad is happening or about to happen or oh my God, this situation. Sometimes your higher self is going to communicate with you whatever way you listen. And sometimes that like gut feeling is the best way that you, it knows you listen to. So when we get these little signals in different parts of our body, sometimes that's the way that our higher self knows us to be able to listen to messages the best. So I'm such a believer of the gut feeling also being from the higher self and also probably something in the quantum level that I wonder that they can measure. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. This was great. Um, I'm also here on Instagram. I'm actually going to be signing off of both, though, because I'm going to be um, heading out after this. Uh, I'm ba banned again on TikTok. Uh, I got banned in between these two videos from this week to last week on my lives. Anyway, um, so everybody, thank you so much. See you guys next Tuesday. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. And let me know what you think. Download the PDF below so that you can have the freeze frame technique on hand. And really, in these times right now, this is the time to practice, to practice these things. Because as time goes on, there's going to be things that are happening in the world that are beyond what our brain, what our mind can understand and comprehend. And it's going to be helpful for us to be able to continue to develop that emotional intelligence, that heart intelligence, and to be able to receive the messages from the heart because, like Turn Racing said, that it can help us sometimes on the quantum level get that feeling, get that gut feeling, get that information, get that, oh, God, I feel like something's off, but I don't know what, to listen to that because there's going to be things that continue to unfold in the world that are beyond what our brain knows, beyond the history that we can understand, beyond a solution that we can come up with. And this is why we can develop that emotional intelligence and be able to get the messages from the heart and be able to regulate our nervous system because more stuff is unfolding and we need to also make sure that our bodies are surviving through the emotions, especially you empaths out there. So if you need to come back to this and refresh, if you find yourself getting too uh, caught up in all the emotions. Thank you guys. I love you so much. Thank you for all your support and always making this a great vibe, a great experience every Tuesday. And